Are you supposed to say Porsche or Porsche? Porsche. You're supposed to say it like that? Ugh. Well, I, I, I don't think I can do it. Ferdinand Porsche, who created the company, that's how he pronounced his name, Porsche. I don't, I don't know Ferdinand. I don't <laughs> Porsche. Porsche. Show for show. It's that time for another Toss Show. How are you? Everyone doing well? I'm excited to be here. Big day here on Toss Show. Eddie, how are you? I'm doing great. How are you doing? How was uh, the weekend? How was my weekend? Yeah. Oh, thanks for asking. Uh, you know, I, uh, it was good. Uh, my wife's birthday. I uh, took her up north, up the coast. Mm-hmm. And, uh, Went out to dinner, and oh, celebrity sighting at dinner that I, that I got excited about. All right, guess who I saw at dinner? Oh, I'm gonna guess like uh, LeBron James. LeBron James at dinner with me? No, no, no. Carol Burnett. Carol Burnett. Ninety year old Carol Burnett at dinner. It was sat right behind me. Now, uh, ask me who had reservations earlier, me or ninety year old Carol Burnett? I think you. I was at five. She was at five thirty. That was great. <laughs> it was great though. I, the whole time I just kept taking photos of my wife, just like real awkwardly, but just trying to get Carol Burnett <laughs> <laughs> in the shot. That's fantastic. I'll show you that. That's silly. I saw another celebrity too, Eddie. As if Carol Burnett wasn't good enough. The very next morning, guess who I see? Bob Newhart, sports talk show host, Colin Cowherd. And I didn't go up and say hi. I was with my kids, and I I was going to, and my wife stopped me and said, "That's not who you think it is." And I go, "That's a, the Colin guy. He's a, a, you know, it's, we will talk sports for a second. I'll say he's just sitting there. I'll talk with him for a second. And, and she said, "No, that's an actor." And then later she goes, "Oh, I think you were right." <laughs> <laughs> so Colin, know that I recognized you, and I wanted to say hi, but my wife said no. Because normally I'm wrong. One time I was at a concert and I uh, I thought uh, Drew Carey was next to me, <laughs> uh, and I'm, I'm I'm again I'm with my kid. I was with one of my kids uh, at this concert and my wife. And I go, hey Drew, and the guy uh, just looks at me, and goes what? And I'm like, oh no. And then my wife goes, that's so embarrassing because he knows that he kind of looks like Drew Carey. <laughs> yeah. And so when you say, hey Drew. And it's and it's not Drew Carey. He's he's like, oh. Anyway. Again. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what are you gonna do? You have a video for me? I do have a video. Dude, you just busted your freaking uh, intercooler? Radiator. You didn't even drive without its radiator? That's the same curb that got Paul Walker. Oof. R.I.P. Can you drive a car after you bust your radiator? I guess for a little bit. Shouldn't be doing that anyway. Beautiful E30 there. I love an E30. Is that second generation 3 Series on a BMW? Oh! Didn't know Tosh new cars. Didn't have that on my bingo card. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking idiots. By the way, if you've ever written that in your life, thinking you were being funny, like, oh, I didn't have that on my bingo card. You're not a funny person, and people don't enjoy listening to you. Okay? So put that on your bingo card. <laughs> Oh, today's guest is, is the biggest of car guys, both literally and physically. Just a huge man. He's my car guy. He's a car broker. I never understand why anyone would go to a dealership to buy a car. You say, oh, because we don't, we don't have the luxury of having someone do it for you. Yes, you do. And you're going to learn that today with Marty, my good friend Marty, who, by the way, no one talks more than Marty. Just long, talks forever, love every word he's saying, but just, if, if you call him, know that you've, you've just, you got to block out 45 minutes, men. Um, but he actually, 
uh, is the first guest that I ever interviewed on this show. So the set's going to look a little different. Probably didn't give him a gift. I hope you can handle it. Enjoy. Tasha. I'm with uh, Marty, the car guy, as I know him, via his email. Thank you for being here. My pleasure. Why did you retire? Well, I was in the car business for 46 years. I turned 65 last summer. My dad retired at 65, so I'm just following in his footsteps. You look great. I try. You grew up here. Our family first came to Los Angeles in the 1850s, so uh -huh. we go way, way back. So there's probably some bad stuff in your history. I would hope so. <laughs> All right, Marty, I don't know if you know this about me. I know nothing about cars at all. Okay. Never been interested in cars. I blame my father. And I assume your father was interested in cars. My dad was a big car guy. The first new car I remember my dad buying was a 1962 Chevrolet Corvair, to which as a five-year-old, I said, Dad, that's not cool. Okay. So one day I'm sitting in the den and my dad comes through the front door and he walked in and he said, go look in the driveway. He upped his ride. And there sitting in the driveway was a brand new, white with red interior, fuel injected, 63 Corvette Stingray split window coupe. And I remember saying, dad, you are now cool. Ah, uh, so he won you over at that point. Absolutely. Growing up with a dad who was a car guy, I loved cars. And in my younger days, I went through everything. I mean, every BMW, every Porsche, every Mercedes, you name it. I had a couple of Ferraris. At what age is this? Oh, from starting at 16 up to probably 30. This is what I never understood. I mean, how do you, like I had a car at 16 and I kept it till I was 25. It was like a Honda Civic. How long do you keep a car before you get another one? I've probably been through conservatively 500 cars in my life. Here's the thing. My father, huge car guy. Everything, knows everything about cars, knows every car, cares about it. And then as a young child, he says to me, and I can remember this, and he'll, he'll, he'll deny that this conversation happened. He said, uh, we're going to buy a complete old Mustang beater uh, for nothing. And you're like, you're 12 or 10 now, whatever it was. And we're going to rebuild the whole thing. And by time we're, it'll take six years. And by time we're done, you'll be 16 and you'll have this car. And guess what? Never got around to it. And I never learned a thing about cars. That's why I think it's so uh, fascinating that, that, I, that I found you uh, because it, it isn't a world that I ever, ever cared about at all. And people that do care about it are so passionate. And then I get embarrassed talking to them because I don't know anything. But you, you know, eliminated the one thing that is the worst thing on the planet besides the dentist. It's buying a car. People hate going to dealerships. They're, no, no, it's 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 unex. I would rather not own a car. Like I was just like, oh, I just I'll just never get a car again. Now I I found you through my business manager and and uh, probably the shortest person in the world that I trust. <laughs> He's been my business manager since I was 22 years old. I'm 48. And when you get a business manager, it's literally like reverting back to a child because you all of a sudden you don't get mail. And your dad takes care of everything. You basically trust them with your life. Right. And people are like, oh, you can't believe you, you do this. Haven't you heard all the horror stories of Hollywood? And it's like, of course I have, but I'm not smart enough to know how to do any of these things anyway. So, you know, I'm, my point is, if I found out 10 years from now, he'd been stealing from me for 35 years. You know what I would say to that? All right, good. He deserves it. That was great. <laughs> as long as he's making money for you, right? I, I don't care if he's making money for me. It's just like he's given me a great life. He's made the right decisions for me. Anyway, I came from nothing and got into show business and got lucky. And and so then all well, of a sudden- Well, not just lucky, talent too. Well, yeah. I mean, it's, a, it's mostly talent. But <laughs> anytime I experience any of these perks that-, that affords itself in this silly world of Los Angeles. I'm like, this is unbelievable. There's a guy that will just let you just say what car you want. And the next day the car arrives. I'm like, this is genius. I'm like, how much am I paying for this service? And then I was told that I'm not paying anything. Exactly right. An honest broker, a dishonest broker will tell you, this is my fee to help you get your car. 
and they're also getting money from the dealer, I guarantee it. So I used to call it double dipping, which I would never do. People would always ask me, well, what's your fee? How do you make money? I say, I get paid out of the deal by the dealer. And they would be, that's it? I said, that's it. Here's the thing you should know about yourself now. I mean, you, you probably already know this, but now you're retired. So it's almost, it's, I sh- it's like talking at someone's funeral, <laughs> saying nice things about them when it's like, oh, well, why didn't you say that when they were alive? But <laughs> everyone says wonderful things about you. Rob, I was talking to Rob just recently. I said, I'm going to talk to Marty. And he's like, oh, he's like, there was no, no one was better at doing what he did. Well, anyway, so, so my point was though, that, that this is just a no brainer. If you can find an honest one, that's the trick. You know, I know a lot of brokers. There are no shortage of them in Los Angeles, and I know most of them. And for the most part, they're good. A lot of them are greedy. So I would play golf sometimes with some of the brokers. And, you know, like one guy said once on a Ford Expedition, he's like, yeah, I put the guy away for $5,000 commission. I'm like, how how can you sell a Ford Expedition and make five grand? If the guy picked up the phone, he'd kill your deal. He said, they don't pick up the phone. They just trust me. And I said, I couldn't do that to one of my customers. How did you get in to being a car broker? Well, I kind of fell into being a broker because I was something else really before being a broker. I was doing what they call gray marketing, Mm -hmm. bringing in cars that weren't available in the United States, uh, maybe previously imported, something like a Porsche 930 Turbo. So in 1979, Porsche quit bringing them into the U.S. And you could buy a car in Europe for a fraction of what they did cost here, import them, legalize them, and be in it, a brand new one, for a lot less money than, say, in 1979 when that was the last year they built them. Is that illegal? Gray, it sounds like it's like close to black market. Uh, Well, it's called gray market because it's a gray area. It's not black. Uh Uh-huh, all right. Okay, so gray market just means it's something that wasn't originally sold here. In In the case of an automobile, it has to be legalized. So the dealers, they hated guys like me, Uh because we were bringing in cars and selling them for a lot less than they were selling them for. And a lot of cars that weren't available. For instance, let's say you wanted a a Mercedes SL. So at the time it was a 380 SL. They were very underpowered. In Europe, they made a 500 SL. So they made a five liter V8 with a lot more horsepower. So people wanted to bring those cars in. The gray market golden years were really about 1980 to 85. The only reason it really died was because uh, the dollar got strong against the mark and you couldn't save money. So it was like, then why buy, Then why do it? Okay. You're going to spend a lot of money. So you ask, how did I become a broker? Well, people that I sold cars to in 80, 81, 82, mm-hmm. they called me and they said, hey, it's time for a new car. And I say, I'm not importing cars anymore. I didn't really know what I was going to do. And they said, well... I don't want to go into a dealer. Could you just sell my car for me and you handle the new car here? So I kind of fell into being a broker. What do people need to know? What's the minimum things people need to know when they're going to buy a car to not get ripped off? The biggest mistake people make is if they go in and say, I can afford $600 a month. You never want to say what you're what you're willing to pay per month. Okay. That's the biggest mistake. You want to establish what they're going to sell you the car for. That's the first thing. And then once you establish that, then you want to base your payments based on that number. But there's all kinds of tricks dealers can play. They have what they call the buy rate on the money, what the bank gives it to them for. They can mark that up. They're free to mark it up. Same thing on a lease. It's a money factor. Most dealers routinely mark up the money factor. So in addition to whatever they're making on the front end of the deal, which is profit on the car, profit on whatever you buy for the car, extended warranty, whatever it might be, um, they're going to make money on the interest. There's no way around to this. There's no way I could, anybody can ever figure it out then. It's really difficult. Get a good broker. When they say, um, I need to go talk to my manager, are they, is that a stall tactic? Or are they really actually going to get approval? They know what they're constrained by ahead of time, what areas they have to work within. So it's probably a little bit of both, but mostly it's probably BS. Okay. So I had a lady that was referred to me, and she wanted to buy a new Hyundai. Dream client. 
She wanted to buy it, and she wanted to put $10,000 down. And they were offering 0% financing. She said, what's my payment going to be with 10 grand down, 0% financing? And I gave it to her. But I said, since you're putting such a large down payment, they have 1.9% financing, but a $1,500 rebate. So your payment is going to go down 20 bucks a month. You know, over 60 months, that's $1,200. She said, no, 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 I want the 0%. I said, okay, let me give you an analogy. You're standing on a corner. I walk over to you. In one hand, I have a $1 bill. and the other hand, I got a 20. Which one are you going to take? She said, well, I'll take the 20. I said, exactly. So take the one nine in the rebate. She said, but I want the 0% financing. I'm not saying that that speaks volumes of all Hyundai owners. <laughs> but you get what you pay for. What about clear code? That seems like another bullshit thing that the industry created. You probably just watched uh, Fargo. You know, you got to get that clear code on. Clear code. Well, no, they, what do they say in Fargo? They don't say clear code. They say, yeah, but that true code. I sat right here and said I didn't want any true code. They say true, true code. code. True code. You got to get that true code. All that stuff, to me is dealer add-on, big profit centers, and garbage. Garbage, good. Garbage. What's the most you've ever made off of a car? Well, it'd be a classic car. It wouldn't of be course. a new car. I did a package deal in 2011 uh, for a very good customer of mine. He had a 1971 280 SE 3.5 convertible, which is very rare, and a 1972 600, which was the grosser Mercedes-Benz. I sold both cars for $600,000. And... He said, what's your fee? And I said, usually to sell a car, I charge 5%, but I feel a little guilty because that'd be $30,000. And I said, so, you know, probably something like half that I think is fair. And he said, what would it have cost me if I sold them at auction? And I said, well, auction houses to the seller they charge 8%, and to the buyer, they charge 10%. So when a car goes through an auction, the auction house is making 18%. And he said, well, I think it's fair I pay you 10%. So he paid me $60,000. Uh-huh. I like this guy. My business manager, he has a quote from you that he uses to this day, just so you know. Okay. And he's, But he credits you. He's, yeah. he's not stealing it. I want you to know. Okay. Uh, uh, there's an ass for every seat. That is a saying of mine. There is an ass for every seat. Name some of your f- famous clients. Well, one that I absolutely adore working with or worked with mm-hmm. was uh, Sylvester Stallone. Oh, Rocky. He's great. You sold a car to Dr. Dre? Dr. Dre. Dre's got great tastes in cars. You ever deal with Exhibit? Remember when he had a car show? I actually, Exhibit was a customer of mine. Uh, he was with one of my business managers. First car I sold him was in 2004 or five when the Bentley Continental GT came out. Uh-huh. I got him one of those. I got him a Range Rover. Biggest uh, oh, asshole client without saying uh, Jay Leno or Jerry Seinfeld. I, I didn't deal with them. Okay. But, but I will mention who was the most difficult to deal with. Difficult. Sure, that's a fair word. Mariah Carey. Ah, I never liked Mariah Carey. I never liked her music. The only music I like of hers is now when she sings live and it's like, oh my goodness, she can't sing anymore. And then <laughs> like those, I enjoy that. But who's your best client? Well, the best, I guess, could mean who have I done the most business with over the years? I don't know. Yeah, sure. Who have you done the most business with? A gentleman who is still with us, thankfully. He's going to be 89 next month. Uh, Why is he driving? He owns Paramount Health Equipment Corporation. So like in the gym, the machines that say Paramount. I've never been to a gym. Okay, look at me. Okay. So he said, you get Donald Brennan's cars. I said, I do. He said, I don't need to hear any more. Get your order pad out. and Just start rattling off cars? A new 500 SEL, AMG, whole thing. For his ex-wife, who he's very friendly with, a new 500 SL. And for his then fiance, a new Carrera convertible. So three cars that morning. And he flew everything in. What's the cost to fly a car in? Uh, this is 1983. It was about... Seven and a half thousand dollars each. Okay, um, it's not as much as I thought you were going to say. Now it's more than double that, maybe triple. Have you ever been approached to uh, uh, sell a stolen car? <laughs> no. What about this? Uh, that bring a trailer website is that is that 
a good place to get a car. I've never sold anything or bought anything there. Uh -huh. I'm familiar with the site. Actually, a friend of mine does put a lot of, you know, he wheels and deals in classic cars. He gets crazy prices for his cars on Bring a Trailer. So if I'm looking for a deal, don't go. Uh, that's not where I should get it. Probably not. Uh huh. Uh huh. You came up to me at Saddle Peak Lodge. I did. I uh, did. A restaurant outside of Calabasas. And you come up to my now wife and you say, Oh, I hope you're enjoying that Mini Cooper. And I looked at you and went, yeah, you looked at me and I went, uh oh, I think I just stuck my foot in my mouth. Right. It was wrong girl. Wrong girl. I got that car for someone else. You did. Oh, she was so insecure at the time, too. She's like, You're <laughs> buying cars for other people? I'm like, Yes. You, one, uh, another girl, a lot, of, a lot of girls in my life with cars. You, uh, you got her out of a Tiguan lease and, and got her into a nice Audi in 24 hours. And she was like, I, I blew her mind. She could, she couldn't believe you pulled it off. Like, got her, broke her lease, got her the new car. It was like 18 or $19 more a month for the brand new Audi. Man, people don't realize that they can upgrade so much more for very little money. How many cars do you think you've sold? Oh, boy. You have any idea? In 46 years, averaging 300 cars a year, 13, 14,000 cars. Yeah, that's a lot of cars. What's your daily driver? I have a 2018 Ford Raptor, which I bought new. Uh -huh. But I also always have a secondary car for the dog. And I'm a big fan of Subaru Outback. Oh, look at you. They didn't even force you to do that. I, now, Subaru and I, have, I've been had a deal with Subaru for over a decade. I started with them on the show because I wasn't a car person. I one time held up a sign. I, said, I, I delivered your first free one to the set. Thank you. <laughs> the, the, I held up a sign like, Subaru, give me a free Outback. And they did. And, well, no. First, they, they put a poll up on their website. Like, should we give Tosh a free Subaru? And then they wanted me to send it out to a large following. What I did, I, I didn't want to do that. That seemed desperate. So I just kept it real quiet and didn't give them any publicity and waited until the very last minute and then had my friends and family flood the votes for the yes. And it was like 56 yes, 14 no. And they were like, this is this backfired horribly. But I got that free Subaru. And then over the years developed a relationship and I, they always would give me them. Um, but it's gotten, it's gotten harder and harder to get free Subarus out of them lately. Anyway, do you race? Were you like into speed? Not per se. I have gone very fast. My record for speed in a car, this gentleman I told you about earlier, Bill Hubner, he bought in 1988 a Ferrari Testarossa. Mm -hmm. And Sir Mix a lot has a song about it. <laughs> he moved it down. He had a home down in uh, Indian Wells. And once a year, the car would have to come in for service. So he'd say, why don't you go spend the weekend, take one of my cars in Beverly Hills, drive down there, spend the weekend at the house, and then bring the Ferrari in for service. And then when it's done, take it back, spend the next weekend. So I was like, twist my arm a little harder. Sure. And it was about 6.30 in the morning. And leaving Palm Springs, it's pretty straight with a couple whoop de doos Yeah, there's some whoop de doos There's some whoop de doos there before you hit the big curve. Uh-huh. But I got that car up to 185 miles an hour. Oh, and, I'm talking to a dead man. And it had more to go. But two things. One, I said, if I get a flat, I'm a dead man. Yep. And secondly, the curve's coming up. So I'm done. But that's the fastest I've ever driven. 185, yeah, that's 100, good. 185 in this Testarossa. Are you a fan of the Fast and the Furious franchise? I watched the first one, and that's it. Uh, you, it really takes I off. Do, and, I do and have a Paul Walker story, though. Oh, you do? Oh. So when the Fast and the Furious, I believe the movie had been filmed, but it hadn't been released yet. And I think it came out, what, in like 2001, something like that. Oh, anyway, no. his agent, or I should, I should take it back, his wannabe agent at that time, because he was shopping agents, his agent called me from William Morris Endeavor and said, I want you to call this guy. His name's Paul Walker. I'd never heard of him. I didn't know who it was. I want you to call him, tell him I'll buy him a new car, whatever he wants. You serious? Dead serious. Never had an agent do anything like this. 
buy your car, anything you want, up to $60,000. Okay. Well, at least they had a cap on it. Put a cap on it. So I called him and I said, uh, so-and-so would like to buy you a car. He's like, excuse me? Mm. It's like, he wants to buy you a car. He's given you a budget of $60,000. And at the time, he uh, got a E... Class Mercedes. It was the V8 with the AMG package, and I think it came in at sixty grand, literally out the door. Oh yeah, you, I would have gone over a thousand and just either paid the thousand out of pocket or. <laughs> I remember the an age. age I, I've never what agent is doing. That's insanity. Yeah, well, it worked. Paul signed signed with this guy. I remember the agent telling me this guy is going to be the new Tom Cruise. That's what was his comment to me. This is going to be the next Tom Cruise. <laughs> Uh, you remember that Mercedes I bought my manager? I do. What did we get her? We got her a 1977 560SL, and this is probably, what, about seven, eight years ago you bought it? I don't know. Something like that. I'm I sure, have a picture of my phone of you I'm driving sure it I'm away sure from the studio. I'm sure wrecked and or not driven is what I'm, <laughs> what I'm positive of. The car at the time, it was close to 40 years old, and it had like, 17,000 miles on it. It was literally like the day it was on the showroom floor. And I remember telling Rob, I said, I've got the best one that Daniel could buy in the world. It's not going to be cheap because it's unique. I'm very generous. Yet still, all I keep thinking about is Paul Walker's agent <laughs> saying, here's $60,000. Go pick out a car. And it wasn't his agent at the time. In he, fairness, though, his eyes, his eyes were so beautiful. <laughs> you know, and I I was I was cursed with just regular old brown eyes that nobody ever wants to dole a dollar out to. How is your memory so good? I have a photographic memory. Do you really? People say they have a photographic memory, but they don't really have a photograph. I do when it comes to stuff long ago. But not so much if you ask me what I had for dinner last night. Okay, yeah. What did you have for dinner last night? Mexican food. Oh. I had a chili relleno, a cheese enchilada, two taquitos, and rice and beans. Jeez Louise. <laughs> Beast. <laughs> what do you think of Jonathan Ward over at Icon? You like that guy? They make the restores those Broncos. Oh, or... oh, I know Icon. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I, I got one of his... Early Broncos, loved it. You know, I was like, oh, this car is amazing. It's kind of understated, but it's still like, you know, cost a fortune. Oh, Some they were, cr he's crazy expensive, but he does beautiful work. Beautiful. And I'm like, I get this thing. And then I realized, oh, now everyone wants to talk to me about the car. And I don't know anything about the car. Right. I'm just the jerk that that could afford it. And I bought, so I always t lie and say, it's my wife's. I'm like, people ask me like, they're like, well, tell me about it. And I'm like, ah, oh, it's my wife's car. I'm just driving it. <laughs> and, and that's how I get by with, with that one. Those early Broncos have a gigantic cult following. Well, um, I didn't know they, that. Yeah. And then Broncos came back into production and now I'm embarrassed to drive it almost, <laughs> but I I'll keep it for, I guess, ever. Is that the rule? Is that what you're supposed to do? Yeah. What are some of the most overrated cars that in your opinion? I, I think of like, you know, like Mercedes Benz, they don't make a single vehicle I would buy today. I just don't find anything that they make interesting. Mm -hmm. You know, driving Rolls Royces, I find them embarrassing. Oh, you do? It, oh, yeah. See, that'll stick with me. I'll be like, oh, Marty said that's embarrassing to be in this car. I still like Porsche 911s. All car people care about Porsches. I just would never, ever want to be in that car. Uh, they're fun to drive. I know. I mean, listen, I'm I'm positive you're right. Are you supposed to say Porsche or Porsche? Porsche. You're supposed to say it like that? Ugh. Well. I, I, I don't think I can do it. Ferdinand Porsche, who created the company, that's how he pronounced his name, Porsche. Uh, I don't know Ferdinand. I don't care <laughs> shit. You ever fuck with boats? Boats? We had one growing up, ski boat. That's it. Never sold a boat? Uh, they're not good buys. They're not good investments. That's well, sure. they say the two happiest days of a boat owner's life is the day he buys it and the day he sells it. Oh, okay. What do you think of Jay Leno in that collection? Is it nonsense? What's going on? Why is he driving around in a steam engine? <laughs> that car almost cost him his life. Is that the one? Yeah. Shocking that that's not up to code. <laughs> <laughs> in 1911 or something. I've run into him at several different car shows. He's always been nothing but a really nice guy and a gentleman in person. I don't know him personally. Serial killer outside, I assume. No, he seems always nice. He's always been nice to me. Yeah. You know, just a nice guy. 
Do you hate Elon Musk or are you a Nazi? <laughs> That's the- I, I think Elon Musk is brilliant. When Tesla was launched, and initially it was just like that little Lotus car that he stuck mm-hmm. batteries in. And when the Tesla Model S came out, which was initially his first car, I said, there's no way he stays in business. See? I wish I would have bought his stock. What do you think of electric cars? I think that they serve a purpose. Mm -hmm. I'm all for if you can do your part to, you know, live in a cleaner environment, all that. I'm all for that. Well, forget the environment part of it. What about the car itself? Do you like where the electric cars are? They're crazy fast. I know. Because you get... 100% 100% of the torque instantly when you step on the accelerator. Well, four motors going too. Yeah, yeah. So you get instant torque, and I mean the thing will just snap your head into the back of the seat. Which is fun. But I like hearing an engine. I like yeah, feeling— Yeah, I'll sit next to you and just go like this. <laughs> <laughs> I like hearing an engine. I like feeling gear shift. Uh. So the kind of eerie quietness of it, a lot of people love it. Me not so much. All right. I got the I have the, the pickup, the Rivian. I saw it. It's very nice. You know, they're an Irvine company. Uh-huh. I thought I was, you know, eight years ago or whenever they said, "Oh, this is coming." I'm like, "Oh, I'll give you a little security deposit, and when this comes out, I'll, I'll get it." And then it came out, and I'm like, "Oh, I love driving." But they told us it was going to do tank turns. You know, where all the wheels were going to spin opposite, so it would just spin in circles. <laughs> and I was really excited about that. But then they won't uh, release that software because it's bad for the environment to like just go destroy in the woods by spinning around everywhere. Anyway, I was oh, excited. Well. I was excited about tank turns. Then I get the <laughs> Rivian. I can't do any tank turns. Dumb. No, my my thing with it is is, is pure convenience. It's great as long as you don't drive a lot. But what if you you know if you got to do a long drive, then you got to plan ahead. Where are you going to stop? Where are you going to charge it? Yeah, you find a super, you got you stop someplace by time you, you do have a, a, a horrible road BM and you get yourself <laughs> something, something to eat. You're back to 80%. Yeah, there you go. Uh, happily married? Uh, happily married. How long? Coming up on three years. Three? Yeah. Yeah, that's real easy to be happy then. <laughs> <laughs> People that don't want to retire ever. I've never understood that. I can't wait to never work again. Are you enjoying retirement? I love not being in the car business anymore. I went from just this absolute passion for cars to it all became just iron. Marty, again, here's what we're the same. When I think about what I do for a living, like people are like, oh, you get to make people laugh and like performing stand-up. I'm like, that is so stupid. Like what? I'm I'm up here. I'm telling jokes to strangers. This is the dumbest way to make a living. I can't even wrap my head around it sometimes at night. I'm like, you know, I, I'll talk to my kid. I'm like, hey, what do you do? And I'm like, yeah, I don't really know. It doesn't make sense. <laughs> well, Marty, thank you very much for being on my show. It's been a pleasure. I appreciate it. I'll see you around. Okay. Thanks, Jan. Thanks, man. Well, Carl, another pod in the books, as they say in the pod biz. Marty, I want to thank you for being on the show. Uh, you're the best. You know, Eddie, after after you played that video in the beginning of this show, it made me actually realize, Marty, I want you to find me an E30 convertible, green. Usually those were UK ones. Uh, you know, so I has to get imported here. I don't need, you know, crazy low miles, but I'd like under 80,000 miles. That's the car I want. And your gift will be the commission on that car. I really would like that car. You think, you think, you think Marty can get it for me, Carl? You'd love it. Sitting in the back of an E30, wind blowing through your hair. Ooh, we're going to get that car. How fast do you think Marty can get it for me? I guarantee he'll find it. It's a unicorn. Uh, all right. Anyway, uh, boyswearpink.com. Check it out. Purchase something. They're going to be collector's items one day. The goat on Prime or Freebie or wherever Amazon is going to release it. Uh, May 4th, the Dolby, the Netflix uh, comedy festival. And now another one of my bedtime stories from my once- three-year-old son. See you next week. Once upon a time, 
the little dies. They try to the Tampazan. They try to the Tampazan. And the Tampazan didn't roll. And the Tampazan didn't roll. So they died on the distance. So they died on the distance. And then they rolled on a bike. And they and then they hit someone on their bite. And then they rolled on a bite and they hit it something right in their bite. And then they saw a seahorse. And then they saw a seahorse. And then they and then they dropped their stone. And then they dropped their stone. The end. Why did you say everything twice in that story? I don't know. That's a weird thing that you did. Like, have you did you have you ever heard somebody do that before? You just made that up. You just want to repeat things twice each time. Yeah. That was that was neat. You like Chris Rock. <laughs>